Hi everyone, this is Akiko. I'm the music director of the Mid-Texas Symphony. And today uh, we have a virtual pre-concert lecture for our upcoming concert on October 17th, American Voices. And I'm so thrilled to be joined by our guest artist, violinist extraordinaire, Charles Yang. Hey, Charles. Hey, Kiko. Hi, Maestra. How are you? Good. Are you tuning in from New York? I'm currently in New York. Just awesome. got back in town. Awesome. Uh, leaving again I soon, but I'm glad I got to catch you here. Yeah. Well, I saw on Facebook that you are recording uh, with Time for Three and Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, Kevin Putz's concerto. Um, so you've been busy. That's right. Uh, that's actually the last thing we did was, well, kind of the last thing we did. That was last week. But uh, yeah, we were two days in, uh, you know, Philadelphia recording both Jennifer Higdon and Kevin Putz's uh, oh, two concertos. Two concertos. And it is a concerto for an orchestra and your trio? Yep. Our trio, Time for Three, and uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra. So that was a real treat. You know, I That's grew up amazing. listening to Philadelphia. Yeah, that was That's a lot of fun. Amazing. Um, so everyone, a lot of you know who Charles is. He's hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's my first time working with Charles, and I know you work with uh, my predecessor, Dave Mars, and the Mid-Texas Symphony many times before, so our audience knows and loves you, and they're so happy to have you back. And I also read in your bio that you're from Austin, Texas, so you're from the neighborhood, and that your mom plays in the Austin Symphony, uh, which is fabulous, and that June 9th is a Charles <laughs> Yang Day in Austin. Austin, is that true? Wow, well, you did a deep dive. I did. So what, what? So on June 9th, should we give a toast to you, or like, if we're not with you in person, like, what is the Charles Yang Day about? Well, June 9th, Charles Yang Day now is exclusively celebrated by my mom and my mom only. <laughs> I don't even remember. Mom uh, for that, yes. Yeah, my mom. She celebrates it, and and she'll call me and say, "Do you know what today is?" And I'm like, "It's my birthday already." No, it's in June, you know, uh, it's not even in June. So she celebrates it on her own. But that was actually, that was uh, when I was in high school. It was a yes. cool, uh, it was a cool party trick. The, uh, the city gave me a, a day and um, my friends all knew about it. So that was fun. That's amazing. Did you get a key to the city or like? Nope. I mean, no a perks. Apparently, if I got a parking ticket on that day, it would have been forgiven. But I uh, didn't even Don't drive that. free parking so. downtown or something. Which yeah. Which is hard in Austin. So I'm working my way up to that. Awesome. Well, um, as Charles mentioned, Charles is a member of this crossover string trio, Time for Three, uh, which is world famous and everyone loves them. Um, and I wanted to... Um, and of course, Charles is a standalone soloist as well. Um, I wanted to just kind of harken back to your past with Dave Mars, our music director emeritus, and the Mid Texas Symphony. How did it? How did you meet Dave, and how did it all start? Oh man, Dave is first of all one of the most beautiful souls I know. He He's is. like a family member. I mean, talk about Mid Texas Symphony, though. Um, you know, I, I've known the Mid Texas Symphony. I've been a part of this community since I was a kid. So, you know, um, every time y'all ask me to come play, I'm like, oh man, it's great to see family again. I can't wait to work with you, you know, uh, this will be new, but uh, the community, uh, Dave especially, you know, has been really like a family member to me um, yes. growing up. Uh, so that actually started because I had won the concerto competition for the Austin Symphony when I was a kid. I think I was like I 10 or nine or 10, something like that. And actually Dave, uh, we played the Sansons concerto and that was the okay. first uh, violin concerto I played with a professional orchestra. So That's that was really fun, <laughs> super fun for me. And we just kept this uh, relationship, he was fun. We played a bunch of high schools in Austin mm -hmm. and uh, he was so relatable. Um, to yes. all the kids there, to me, and um, and I was just so eager to work with him again. So it's just been a really great career uh, that him and I have had together. That's I'm amazing. very grateful. And I know he loves you so much. Uh, and I and love him. 
he wants to continue working with you. Um, speaking of career, so you are a Juilliard trained, classically trained violinist, but you also are part of this crossover band and you're also a vocalist and a composer and you are a genre bending guy. Um, how did somebody who grew up with kind of a straightforward, very, you know, I don't want to say strict, but mainstream classical music education, when did this crossover genre bending begin? Well, like you said, my mom is a violin player. She's in the Austin Symphony and actually left the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, uh, you know, she was a part of that during that time, went to Shanghai wow. Conservatory and, and came wow. here to study in Austin, Texas. Um, and my dad as well, uh, he's not a musician, but um, was very interested in music. But the idea of um, traditional music was just classical music for them, you know? Um, that was what they kind of fought for, but also what they played and listened to. Mm. So that's what I grew up with in my household. I'm my only child. So at home, the records were all, you know, Heifetz, Oistrakh, um, Perlman, and, and the most extreme record we had was the Three Tenors. And I loved that record. <laughs> I loved it. I was like, this is, this is awesome. This is so different from violin music. But, um, yeah, I went to public school in Austin and, you know, none of my friends knew what I was listening to, you know? Right. So um, I remember on the playground in elementary school, um, there's a new Britney Spears record or um, some record that had just come out. And a friend had, you know, said, have you checked this out? This new Britney Spears record. And I, and I said, no, but I, I just got this new Pincus Zuckerman uh, ah. CD have you guys checked that out? And they were like, who's that? You know, you're the cool kid now. Well, no, I, it blew my mind. It blew my mind that my friends didn't know these idols that I had right. been listening to at home. So um, that was kind of the start of my journey. It's like, what, if my friends don't know it, like, why can't I get them into it in any right. way possible? Right. And they were into the blues because we're from Texas and, you know, they got me into the blues. I started playing the blues on the violin, started playing rock and roll on the violin, all these songs that they were familiar with. And they started to kind of latch on to what a violin was, you know, um, and all the rip that I was playing. So actually uh, a couple friends had come to the Mid-Texas and they'd never been to a concert before, like right. a symphony concert. And they came to one of the Mid-Texas symphony concerts that I played um, when I was younger. And um, it, they were just like, man, that was, we never knew this world you know we never knew the side we just thought you were charles from school you know and That's it was um it was really exciting for me to get my friends to 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 listen actually one time my friend um i had played zagorner in one time on from the top on public radio and yeah. my friends remembered that name they remember the tune zagorner by sarasate yeah. and uh not too long ago my friend called me and was like dude i just heard you on the radio and I said, really? What, what, uh, how, I don't think I was on the radio. And I was like, yeah, man, I just heard the corner visor. They thought you were like, the only one that played. Yeah. That. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's just incredible that my friends remembered, uh, first of all, the name the corner Yeah. And, um, and, a, and it's and a piece for violin literature that, um, that was written hundreds of years ago. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's uh, it sounds like you, I mean, you're an extraordinarily talented child prodigy growing up, but then you were surrounded by normal kids and not necessarily music kids. And you grew up in a relatively normal environment, which was, I think, important like in your development because, I mean, this is what allows you to be relatable to other you know, non-music people and to help them enjoy the music and then bring so many different kinds of music to them. Yeah, I, I think it was never, it always came naturally to me. It, it wasn't a, um, a forced thing, you know. I, I was always curious to learn, first of all, the blues, learn all these classic rock songs that my friends were listening to. Not because I wanted to be a part of it, but I was literally, I was legitimately curious about it. Right. So I, I, I listened to it, I liked it, I started getting really into it, and that led to... Um, this kind of natural um, organic bond that my friends had with, with music. Um, so, and that still continues with time for three, you know, our, our kind of idea is just 
music is the universal language and how right. can we bring all the people in to, to speak to each other? So that's, that's uh amazing. That's, that's so uh, needed right now to uh, bringing people together. Um, and music, yeah, absolutely. All kinds of music is the best way. Um, before we get into the corn gold, you know, I just want to ask um, for myself personally, I'm a terrible improviser. I'm married to the print. And I think a lot of classical musicians are that way, but you're one of the rare birds um, that is able to improv and across many different genres. Um, just tell me what is, how do, how do I unlock this, um, this kind of stuck, being stuck on the print and not being able to uh, be flexible that way? Well, let me tell you, on, on most occasions, I'm a terrible improviser too, you know? No. It's those, yeah, it's those special times when I play a solo and I shock myself. That's when I, uh, that, that's what keeps me going, you know? But, but a lot of the times it's scary. It's scary to go up there and, and make up stuff, um, right. to really make up something, um, especially if you're playing with other, other players. But um, it's just something, just like as we would go and perform uh, a concerto or a symphony, you know, um, that kind of rush is there. You just have to take that step to do it. You know, um, the stage is not meant for everybody. Right. Um, but for the people that do do it, they took that step. So for me, it was taking that step to kind of be vulnerable. You know, uh -huh. I didn't start, I didn't start improvising until, you know, um, late middle school, high school. When my friends literally that um, learn guitar like a month before, the first things they learn is the blues pentatonic progression. Yeah. So they taught me that. Um, I started playing on my violin. They taught me all these other scales that I had been playing every day. But since I was age three, I've been playing G major scale, C major scale. <laughs> but I always thought it was just for my technique and like um, just for intonation, for bow and but right. there's a function there, right? There, there was a, I, it was, I remember it clicked and I was like, oh, these scales all have a function. And, you know, this goes here, this goes in this chord. And uh, it was just so fun to put the puzzles together. So I'm still learning every day, you know, um, how well, to- You're far ahead of me in that department and, and in other departments too, but especially in this no, 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 no. vulnerability part, um, it, it sounds to me like, it, like that, um informs they like the two sides two worlds inform each other in your career is that right I mean. absolutely yeah i mean it's it's a scary thing to do anything um you know to show anything to perform anything so um but but the idea the discipline is always the same right um mm -hmm. to 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 just kind of let go but also rein in what you need to hone in on what you need to improve on so it's very similar. I think that mindset was um, a lot of people find foreign in the classical music world, but just going over to that side and really learning um, at least the basics of things is is a lot of fun. And it's um, it's not as daunting as you think, you know. That's true. And I mean, nobody else has painted it that way, that there are actually more similarities between the two. They're both the same thing. They both require some sort of... A you know, basic understanding and rules and discipline, like you said, and knowledge right. and mastery of the language. And then only when you have mastered that language, you can take off and be free. And it's right. whether you're right, you're playing printed notes or not, or you're playing based on harmonies or something like that. Well, that is very cool um, and refreshing outlook. So thank you for that. Um, now let's dive into the corn gold. Uh, you'll be playing the corn gold violin concerto for us. Uh, not only are you a crossover violinist, but this is also very much a crossover piece, I think, uh, because Absolutely. out as a opera classical composer in Austria, he came to Hollywood in the 1930s and he brought his symphonic language and operatic language straight into the film industry and really made, he was one of the people that made film music what it is today uh, in America and beyond. Right. And this concerto is kind of a backwards, um, it's a, a re-import uh, because he wrote this toward the end of his career in 1945 and he re-imported some of his film scores into the concerto. Um, I remember when you and Jason, our executive director and I did a three-way Zoom during the pandemic to think about what 
we could do instead of having you come in person. I said, what, what excites you? What, what do you think you want to do? You know, just if you could do anything and you said the corn gold, like why did you, why corn gold and what does this piece mean to you? Well, I mean, it is one of my favorite concertos um, of all time. I, I even remember loving it before I even played it. I was a kid in Aspen I, and I saw uh, another student perform there, um, mm. the Corn Gold Violin Concerto. I never heard it. And I was like, this is absolutely gorgeous. Yes. You know, I fell in love with it. It was heart wrenching, but also exciting. Um, it, and, and and I could visualize a lot of things, you know, mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, like you said, every movement of this concerto has something borrowed from a movie that he had mm -hmm. written in the past. So yeah. it is, um, I didn't know that, but I could visualize what, what it, what would be happening. So I remember loving it um, even before playing it. When I played it, I learned it from my teacher, Glenn Dictro. Um, and that year he actually performed with the New York Phil and I went and was just so inspired. Oh. First of all, just having my teacher be playing my favorite piece was just so exciting. And he's just such an amazing player. And he studied with Heifetz who oh. was, um, you know, he, he owns the piece, doesn't it? He he he, he owned that piece. Mirrored it and recorded it. Yes, yes. Exactly. So um, that just that legacy was exciting to me. But in terms of the piece, you know, it is so free. It is, um, you know, a lot of concertos we we hear so many versions, but within a frame. If you listen to the Corn Gold Violin Concerto, there's there's all these small phrases that no one does the same, you know? And, and it's just, there's so much what we call rubato, which is just, right. you know, just kind of free playing and, and um, playing within the bar. And um, I I really relate to that because in, you know, in the blues, for, for example, you know, you don't play on every beat, you know, it's, um, you feel it. So there's notes within the beat um, and outside of it. And, and that really was a, uh, Maybe that's why I like it so much. But uh, yeah, when, when you asked, I said, hey, if I can, you know, in a, in a season, if I can choose what I want to play, because there's, there's not a lot of time that I get off from the road um, from time for three. Um, right. This is a concerto that I really love, love that's to do awesome. every time. That's awesome. And it's to me, it's so interesting that you say it, there's a lot of freedom because when I look at the score, I'm overwhelmed by all the details and it yeah. looks very st structured. And you're right. I mean, a lot of people take liberty here and there that aren't printed, although he does put, you know, some instructions here and there. But you're right. It is free. And a lot of it relies on your romanticism and your personal feeling, um, you know, but you're also kind of in the structure of the symphony orchestra and you know gazillion instruments and right also within the orchestra i wanted to tell the audience a lot of the sex string sections are divided into multiple parts and it it's a lot of different parts uh coming together um to kind of surround you know the violin solo part um and you said that you could visualize things like can you share and I don't know if there's anything tangible or it's just kind of general feeling. Can you share something about each movement that you feel or you think about? Um, well, I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, it's, I don't think it's really just a painted picture, but um, the first movement just opens with this theme that is just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so grand, you know? Yes. Um, and we start we together. Have, with you we and start audience. together. I don't That's have to amazing. wait 15 minutes like the Beethoven <laughs> Um But uh, right. we start together and we end together, you right. know? And it's just, um, it's one of those, sorry, um, keep, <laughs> keep getting these calls. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, it is, it's just, uh, once it opens like that, it's just so grand. I remember the first time hearing it, just being immediately, someone saying once upon a time, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. with that opening, do, do, de, do, da, 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 you know, it's just so once upon a time, That's but right. also 
something ethereal about it, like something sci-fi about it, mm, almost uh, futuristic. Star Wars. Yes. Yeah, futuristic. So very much. And if you if you listen to John Williams now or a lot of movie composers, again, Korngold is the godfather of all this um, movie music, and a lot of it is inspired by him. So. Um, yeah, I, I I think coming from having seen a lot of movies with John Williams' a score, I saw Corn Gold. Uh, I heard Corn Gold for the first mm -hmm. time, and was like, oh, I, I can relate to this. So first movement, yeah, I, I think that struck me just once upon a time, and then it just goes on a journey. But second movement is just this kind of calm, serene, almost like a lake, almost like uh, the beginning of Sibelius Violin Concerto, but much warmer it's not a cold mm -hmm. lake you know it's just a lake in the springtime you know right. it's not finland <laughs> yeah it's not finland no it's la it's, yeah. yeah yeah and um the third moment for me is just this rocket ship <laughs> you know it's yeah. just an ongoing uh perpetual motion kind of um not to mention the, you know, the Cornwall Violin Conjure is not only hard for the violin soloist, but it is a really challenging piece in general for the orchestra, yes. for everybody. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, for it's, <laughs> it it's is really real hard and it goes by so fast, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's very exciting um, and adventurous uh, and on many levels. Um, yeah. So what do you feel? Do you feel anything in these movements? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you described, and I definitely feel that futuristic um, thing. And I was trying to put yeah. my finger on it. You know, um, we're doing a concert later in the season uh, called John Williams and Beyond, and we start off with um, something by Korngold that you know probably the main title of Star Wars was based on. And we go back and forth. I mean, cool. John Williams and non-John Williams music. So I totally agree with you. I think he influenced John Williams and many film composers greatly. And I was just thinking maybe it's, um, I don't want to get too technical, but you know, the there's a lot of harmonies where it's it goes up by whole step, like the beginning of the last movement. Um, yes. It's, it's in D major, then the next harmony is E major. And usually in, you know, tonal music, it would be E minor, but then he makes sure that the, the second is also a major. And I thought that kind of brightness and the big jump, and even though it's only a second, you know, one step, and that's kind of like a big jump for us who are used to, you know, common practice period music. And I thought, right. but that like stuff like that, I feel like really, you know, sound, just keeps rising. It keeps rising, and it, yeah. I think that aspirational feeling, um, which to the audience, I'm also going to talk about, like with Hanson, and um, I think. There's something about American music, you know, and ironically, he came from an Austrian immigre. Yep. You know, but I think he knew what he was doing to make people feel excited, to feel like they're going to the next step somewhere in the future. Um, so that's sort of my personal, you know, uh, I feel that. Yeah. Very personal discovery about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the openness, expansiveness of the first movement. And the romance, you know, the romantic theme of the second movement is just all very, very gorgeous, but very challenging um, yeah. for the orchestra too. So I'm, you know, so glad we're doing it with you because the orchestra knows you very well, uh, or a lot of people in the orchestra have seen you kind of grow up uh, with Dave, um, bringing you, and uh, it's, I mean, they're going to be yeah. really happy to see you. So I got to let you go because I know you're a busy guy, but speaking of busy, tell us uh, what you're up to either between now and our show or right after our show. Um, you can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember past tomorrow. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm, uh... I'm doing a chamber music show this week. Um, next week, time for three goes to Georgia, I think, and then I'm then I'm with you guys. So um, awesome. yeah, that and then and then you can ask me then what I'm doing the next week. <laughs> Let's make it one week at a time, right? Yeah, one week at a time. That's but Akiko, awesome. you've been awesome. I can't wait to work with you. It's gonna I'm be so awesome. so excited. Yes, it's going to be great to meet you in person and do this piece with the orchestra. So thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you very soon. Yeah, and I'll see you guys soon. The community that I grew up with. I That's love you right. guys. That's right.
Thanks, Charles. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye. Hey. Okay. All right. Well, that was Charles Yang, um, the violinist. Um, so I hope you enjoyed hearing his thoughts on the corn gold and just his really eclectic background um, and as a virtuoso crossover violinist. So now I wanted to talk about the other three pieces. Um, if you haven't noticed, the common theme of this program is crossover. Um, and uh, we're calling this whole program American Voices because to me, that's what makes America great, uh, is that there are so many different influences. Um, everyone or everything is has at least two sides to it and two perspectives and two backgrounds, um, whether it's cultural or race or time periods or styles. Um, and that's uh, the kind of the beauty of being an American. So we put together a collection of pieces, including the corn gold, that defied, you know, just being uh, pegged in one genre. Um, so let's start at the top of the program. We're going to open the concert with Gershwin's uh, music from Porgy and Bess. Porgy and Bess is you know, undoubtedly the most important and famous American opera of the 20th century. Um, it was composed by none other than George Gershwin, who himself, he was um, of Ukrainian Jewish origin, grew up in Brooklyn, um, played the piano in Timpan Alley and absorbed all the jazz and blues idioms um, and incorporated them into the classical idioms. So he himself, was already combining classical and jazz, but he took it a step further and incorporated these um, other media, um, idioms into the opera. Um, it is based on a story por named Porgy by Dubose Hayward and uh, who uh, became the lyricist uh, for the opera. And of course, uh, George's brother Ira um, also worked on the uh, opera. And uh, we are doing a seven minute excerpt from a piece called Symphonic Picture from Porgy and Bess. This is kind of the instrumental greatest hits medley uh, from the opera um, uh, by Robert Russell Bennett. Um, it's very lush and evocative of the opera. And uh, we're going, the seven minutes will consist of music from the introduction to um, Act One, followed by the famous song, Summertime, um, and then Porgy's song, I Got Plenty of Nothing. And then it will end with music from the finale, Oh Lord, I'm on my way. So it should be very exciting. Um, it's quite virtuosic for the orchestra, so it shows off the orchestra. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to play it with the Mid-Tech Symphony. After that, we welcome Charles to the stage and we will play the corn gold together. Um, and, uh, we, I mentioned during my interview with Charles that um, Korngold incorporated his own film scores into this concerto um, in 1945. And I just want to mention the names of the film. Some of them he won uh, Oscars for, you know, best music for. So the, uh, in the Korngold, the first movement, uh, he used themes from his film um, scores to Another Dawn, which is 1937 film. And then the second theme is from Juarez uh, of 1939. The second movement, the Romanza, uh, the theme is from Anthony Adverse, 1936. And the last and third movement, uh, The Prince and the Pauper is the film where he borrowed the main theme um, from himself. Uh, and that was 1937. So he literally borrowed from himself um, and uh, created this classical concerto inspired by, I mean, modeled after the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, um, speaking of something that starts right off the bat with the orchestra and the soloist together. Uh, but he created a very, very unique sound that sounds like Hollywood to us because Hollywood sounds like corn gold. So, um, and I, I read somewhere that um, corn gold's wife said that to him, going from writing operas to writing film scores was not a big jump at all. He actually felt that they were basically the same thing. Uh, and the, he felt that the libretto or the script of an opera is the same thing as a story of a film. And the, the music that he writes supports the telling of the story. Of course, in movies, there are dialogues um, 
and explosions and a lot of action and the visual, um, you know, the silver screen. But he really felt that um, they were kind of the same thing. Um, and that's why he had such an easy time transferring his symphonic writing into the film score. And in turn, he wound up really being one of the composers um, that influenced the way Hollywood film scores sound today. Then we'll take an intermission. And after the intermission, we have a very, very exciting piece called Strum by a living American composer, Jesse Montgomery. Uh, Jesse Montgomery uh, wrote this piece originally as a string quartet with an optional bass, uh, or what she calls the cello quintet, because it features the cello heavily at the beginning. Um, she wrote it for her own group, um, Providence String Quartet, and uh, eventually, uh, that was in 2006, and eventually she revised it and revised it and then turned it into a string orchestra piece, which is the version you'll hear at our concert. Uh, Jesse Montgomery is another composer, American composer, who successfully melds different styles of music uh, and incorporates them into classical music. In the case of Strum, um, there's a heavy folk music influence. Literally, she has the string players of the orchestra strum um, their strings uh, with their fingers up and down, kind of like you would strum a guitar. And it's actually in the instruction um, to the players um, that you do that, the up and down motion of strumming the guitar on their strings. Um, and uh, you'll hear some influences of kind of tinge of pop um, and folk. And uh, it's very tuneful, super rhythmic. Uh, it's a tour de force for the string orchestra uh, to play. Um, and just as in the corn gold, um, each section of the orchestra is divided into multiple parts. So uh, it requires a lot of individual as well as collective effort. Um, and it's very exciting. Uh, if you're interested in music of Jesse Montgomery, she is now the composer in residence at the Chicago Symphony. She has a lot of other music out um, for the string orchestra, such as Starburst. Uh, and she's truly one of the most prolific and popular American composers living today. So I hope that you um, get to know her through our concert. The last uh, piece we will hear on this concert is Symphony Number no. Two, nicknamed Romantic by Howard Hansen. Uh, he was an American composer, uh, born and raised in Nebraska. Um, and uh, his major career was being uh, the director of the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Um, and he also conducted the Eastman Rochester um, orchestra um, and uh, made many recordings uh, as a conductor, including a um, couple um, of the Romantic Symphony number no. two. Um, this symphony is about 23 minutes total. It is actually only in three movements. Um, and the 23 minutes will go by pretty quickly for you because he reuses the same themes throughout uh, the three movements that thus kind of bringing everything together and creating such a sense of cohesion. One of those themes uh, first introduced in the slow part of the first movement, Lento, is um, colloquially known as an interlocking theme. Um, interlocking is a music school um, for talented high school students and also a very prestigious summer festival, uh, summer camp, uh, if I may say so, in Michigan. And uh, a lot of uh, I'm sure a lot of members of our symphony have attended the summer camp, if not have gone to Interlochen uh, for high school. Um, but it's a very, very prestigious place for young people to study music, uh, whether it's during the year or summer. And Howard Hansen um, was inspired to write this theme in 1928 while he was visiting Interlochen. And in 1930, the Boston Symphony um, and their conductor, Sergio Kusevitsky, commissioned him to compose a uh, symphony for their anniversary year. And he wrote this piece for the Boston Symphony. Uh, but he later dedicated um, this theme, um, the Lento theme from the first moment of the um, second symphony to the Interlochen. 
um, school. And uh, so I understand it's a tradition at the end of every summer that they play 80 seconds of this uh, theme from the um, first movement at their closing um, concert. And apparently you're not supposed to clap at the end of that. So if you have been to Interlochen, um, you can let me know if this is true. Um, I have not, but apparently this is tradition. Anyway, um, to illustrate how kind of emotionally impactful um, and uplifting this theme, Interlochen theme is, um, it was used in actually multiple film scores. Um, the film Alien, the original one in the 1970s. Um, yes, that was um, in the end credits uh, of Alien. Um, there was a separate film composer for the soundtrack, but Ridley Scott, the director, unbeknownst to the composer, swapped out a part of the end credit music with music from Hansen's Symphony Number no. 2. He also didn't tell Howard Hansen. And Howard Hansen was quite mad, but and he thought about suing them, but he took it back and he kind of decided to live with it. Um, but you can tell how emotionally impactful this symphony is and the music is, uh, especially that theme, the Interlochen theme. I just learned that it also comes up in a more contemporary film, um, Boss Baby, which I have not seen. It's from 2017. Uh, it's an animated film about a baby uh, who is bossy. And uh, at the end um, of the film, kind of like an arrangement of this uh, piece, uh, Howard Hansen's Symphony Number no. 2 is played as the baby realizes that the family love is more important than anything else. Um, and so love conquers all. And this theme is used here uh, in a little bit transformed way, but there are snippets that are obviously from Hanson Symphony Number no. 2. So clearly uh, this piece has a lot of emotional impact um, that I think you'll really enjoy. Now, one of the more, um, one of the most examples of the influence of uh, this symphony is, um, you know, Charles mentioned John Williams and how Korngold influenced John Williams. Well, um, I think John Williams was also influenced by Howard Hansen because his uh, flying theme from E.T. Um, sounds a lot like the opening of the third and last movement of Symphony Number no. 2 by Howard Hansen. And John Williams is very open about this influence. He doesn't hide the fact that he was inspired by that. It's not a copy or anything, but it sound, there's this motion um, that sounds a lot like um, Hansen 2, the, the finale from Hansen, Symphony Number no. 2. Um, so without, you know, Howard Hansen was not like Korngold. He was not going to be a film composer at all. He was writing uh, kind of a, a brand new American symphony based on the European tradition. Um, but even he couldn't <laughs> help but be used for films. Now, what does that tell us? Um, you know, I talked about it a little bit with Charles earlier, but I think that the aspirational aspect of American music, maybe the harmonies, the rhythm. Um, I think that's very American. I think all of us in this country are aspirational. We are looking for the next thing, the next bright, brightest thing, and uh, always looking to the future, um, more so than our European counterparts. Um, when it comes to, you know, history and classical music. And I think that sense of adventurousness, adventurousness and aspiration end up coming out, oozing out of original American music. And I feel that about all four pieces that we'll be performing on this American Voices program. Um, and that's kind of, that's one of the reasons I put them together um, in one program, because I think it's a very unique quality about our country, our people, um, and uh, it's very exciting and uh, uplifting. So I wanted to end today's um, pre-concert lecture with a quote from George Gershwin that I thought was so 
apt um, and that kind of summarizes how I feel about American music and the multicultural nature of it. George Gershwin said, true music must reflect the thought and aspirations of the people and time. My people are Americans. My time is today, end quote. So I will leave you with that. Um, although these pieces were written, you know, except for the Montgomery, you know, in the middle of the 20th century or earlier part of the 20th century, they still feel very fresh um, and new because of this aspirational nature. And I think that's what being an American means. Um, and if it, this whole thing feels very relevant today. So I can't wait to have you all join us at Canyon High School on Sunday, October uh, 17th at 4 p.m. Uh, with Charles Yang and the Mid-Texas Symphony. So I look forward to seeing you and thank you so much for joining me today. Bye.